Thank you, Stu, and thank you to all of you for attending today. It's very exciting to see so many people have come today um, who are interested in learning more about the immune system. So, sorry. How do I move my slides? Excuse me, technical issues. Oh, okay. So as Stu mentioned, I'm a clinical immunologist and I work out at Liverpool Hospital in southwestern Sydney. And there I see patients with lots of different types of disorders of the immune system as Stu has just gone through. But in the last five years, I've been incredibly fortunate as to work right here at the Garvin alongside these fantastic world-class immunology scientists, really delving into the finer details of how our immune system works. So today, in the next 15 minutes or so, my task is to tell you a little bit about your amazing immune system and also about when your immune system is not so amazing and that the group of conditions that I'm going to be talking to you about today are the primary immunodeficiencies. So I'm going to go through about what is a primary immunodeficiency, how I might diagnose a primary immunodeficiency in clinic, what are the treatment options that are available at the moment, and how research at the moment is really increasing hope and broadening the horizons in terms of how we can improve the treatment of people with these rather complex disorders. So your immune system is like your own internal defence system. And it's designed essentially to fight against foreign things, which are mainly infections like bacteria and viruses. So on the whole, your body has a good balance of your immune system and it protects against infection. So I just want you to have a think about the last time you had a cut on the skin. What did you think about that? Did anyone think that this was going to be a really life-limiting event? I'm guessing not. However, if this had happened to you in 1937, the situation would have been rather different. And in fact, if you had gotten a, a skin cut and that got infected by the common organism Staphylococcus aureus, which some of you may know as golden staph, there was an 80% likelihood that you would have died from this infection. Now, seven years later in 1944, if you had gotten the same infection, the situation was markedly better. In fact, it was about the, other opposite, uh, the other way around, and only about 20% of people would have died from that. And if you were paying attention to Stu's talk, you would know why that was the case. And that was because, in the meantime, Alexander Fleming had discovered penicillin and had come into regular use to prevent infections. So these days, with the benefit of a working immune system and judicious use of antibiotics, we think we're pretty OK against infection. So I've talked about what happens when you don't have antibiotics. What about when your immune system doesn't work so well? Well, in people who are born without a work, good working immune system, we call um, this group of disorders primary immunodeficiency. And obviously, then you have a problem with controlling infection. Now, primary immunodeficiencies individually are a rare collection of disorders. There's actually now more than 350 of them. And even as a doctor, I really can't keep up with all these new disorders. But grouped together, they're not so rare. It's about one in 500. And Stu already mentioned this little boy, David Vetter. So primary immunodeficiencies aren't very common. It's not the sort of thing that you know, comes up in Grey's Anatomy or maybe a country practice back in the day. I don't ever remember seeing primary immunodeficiencies then. But um, David Vetter did become rather famous because of that John Travolta movie, and he grew up in this bubble. And remarkably, this was the 70s, and he lived till the age of 12 because he lived in this sterile bubble that protected him from infection. David's problem was that he didn't have functioning white cells called lymphocytes. And lymphocytes are honestly the best cells in your immune system. And I am a little bit biased because I have been studying them for the last five years. But <laughs> they are the cells that actually provide the, protective, the specific protective immunity that Stu was talking about and the memory. So they're the cells that remember if you've seen something once, they remember it and fight it harder and stronger ne the next time so you don't see it again. So unfortunately, David passed away at the age of 12, 
from a cancer related to an infection. And you would think that, you know, in, in 2018 we'd be doing better, but unfortunately this condition, severe combined immunodeficiency, is still fatal in early infancy if it's not detected. We can treat it with early bone marrow transplantation, but that in itself is a risky procedure, and in some instances, one in five won't make it through that procedure. So um, we've already covered vaccination, so I won't go through the Edward Jenner story, but I'll just show you some uh, data from uh, the chickenpox vaccine, which is one of the newer vaccinations, and that came out in 1999. Um, and as you can see, after it came out, the rates of chickenpox went down. And back in the day, it was a very common childhood illness. We hardly ever see this anymore. Now, the reason why I bring up vaccination, not only because it really underpins how great our immune system is, but this is one of the tools I use in clinic to determine whether or not someone has an immunodeficiency. So if you don't have an immunodeficiency, your, your immune system won't respond to vaccines and then you're sort of back you know, in the dark ages, again, where you're susceptible to these childhood um, illnesses that should have been a thing of the past. So when should you be worried if you have a primary immunodeficiency? As I said, it's a real hodgepodge of uh, disorders, 350 of them, so I can't go through all of them, but the Jeffrey Modell Foundation has come up with 10 warning signs, and they suggest that if you have two or more of this, you should consider that maybe your immune system does need to be assessed. So these include four or more new infect ear infections in one year, two or more serious sinus infections within one year, two or more months on antibiotics with little effect, two or more pneumonias, so that's bacterial infections of the lung in one year, failure of a baby to gain weight or grow normally, recurrent deep skin or organ abscesses, persistent thrush in the mouth or fungal infection of the skin, need for intravenous antibiotics to clear infections, so that's through a drip, two or more deep-seated infections, including septicemia, or a family history of primary immunodeficiency. So I might see patients who've had two or more of these symptoms, but that doesn't mean they have an immunodeficiency. What I would do is obviously do some blood tests, and now we have genetic tests available. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of immunodeficiency disorders that we have been studying here at the Garvin. So this artwork is by William Blake, and it depicts the scene in the book of Job, where Satan smites Job from head to toe with boils. So we have been studying Job syndrome, which was first described in 1966, and back then we were allowed to call medical disorders after people. Um, these days it's now called autosomal dominant hyper IgE syndrome, which is rather a mouthful, <laughs> because we've moved away from um, eponymous and, uh, and names. And interestingly, the gene causing this, this disorder was found relatively recently in 2007. Now, patients with this disorder, well, they're called Job syndrome for obvious reasons. They do have problems with boils in their skin, but they also have problems with recurrent chest infections, sinus infections, and thrush. So some of those 10 warning signs of immunodeficiency. Now, unfortunately, we can't cure Job syndrome, and we don't have good treatments for Job syndrome. As Chris said, our approach is one-size-fits-all at the moment, and so I'm just going to talk about our current one-size-fits-all approach to immunodeficiency in the clinic. So there's antibiotics, which are used to prevent infection, but obviously you're all aware now there's problems with developing antibiotic resistance. There's um, antibody, antibody transfusions we can do, so that's a donated product but it's quite tedious and cumbersome for the patient. So the way we give it in Australia at the moment predominantly is through intravenous infusion. So my poor patients have to come into hospital every month. Um, remember, a lot of these people have had immunodeficiency since childhood, and so that means you know, they can't go on their big gap year overseas because every month they need to have their, their infusions. And thirdly, I've already talked about bone marrow transplantation, but that's a, a pretty risky procedure that's designed to reboot the, that patient's immune system with someone else's immune system. So this is why at the Garvin we've been studying patients with Job 
Job's syndrome, and we've developed a genetically identical model as well of Job's syndrome to try and work out more of the nuts and bolts and the details of what might be going on in Job's syndrome. So, to put it simply, what we know about these white cells, these lymphocytes, when they meet infection, is that they're very clever. Not only do they develop memory, but they also sort of divvy themselves up into cells that have different jobs. So, some cells will protect against viruses and bacteria, another group against parasites, another group will patrol and protect the skin and mucous membranes. Another group will also then control their sort of colleagues to dampen down that immune response. And then another group will work on getting the antibodies out. So we hope that by understanding the real specifics of what's wrong with the immune system in these people, we might be able to find a better treatment option. And so the next story I'm going to tell you about is where looking at the immune system in more detail has led to a new therapy. So this syndrome was only described in 2014, so it's not named after anyone. It's unfortunately called activated PR3 kinase syndrome, so I won't expect anyone to remember that after this, um, this talk. But essentially, this um, condition was only described in 2014 by a large international collaborative group, including members from our laboratory. Um, and the causative problem was found to be an overactive enzyme. So just to kind of explain what an enzyme is, it's like a little powerhouse in your cell. And it takes these inactive yellow messenger molecules and then processes them to become active messenger molecules. But what happens in this particular syndrome is that the enzyme becomes quite overactive and starts producing way too much message. And this message sort of wreaks havoc in the immune system, a bit like an overflowing tap. So... Um, this syndrome is interesting in that it's a really good example of how important your immune system is. Um, uh, so patients with uh, this particular immunodeficiency have what we call immune dysregulation. So not only do they get symptoms of uncontrollable infection, they also have problems with cancer because, again, cancer is something that's foreign that the immune system should be controlling. And they also get the other problem of autoimmunity where the immune system attacks itself. So here um, in the Division of Immunology in Professor Tangy's lab, um, we have been studying this condition to work out, again, what exactly is going on with which cells and why, to see how that affects diagnosis and treatment. And it has been quite fortuitous, because when it was discovered that the problem was this overactive enzyme, there already existed a drug that, would, that had already been developed for the treatment of an unrelated cancer available that actually dampens down this enzyme. And so in the lab, we were able to make a genetically identical model to study this drug. And we've had some really exciting and pleasing results showing that using this drug does fix some of those immune problems that the patients have. So how do doctors and scientists work together at the moment in the field of immunodeficiency? Well, it's quite an exciting time. We have this Clinical Immunogenomics Research Consortium in Australia. So what I can do now is if I have a tricky patient that I see in clinic, I can send their blood over here and get their gene sequenced. I can find what the genetic problem is, have an exact model made of that genetic problem, for it to be studied and potentially, as I described in the previous case, find a new drug or a new way of treating it. So I'm going to finish with this beautiful artwork here called The Doctor by Luke Fields. And this painting uh, is said to have drawn from the artist's own life experience when sadly his one-year-old son passed away from a terrible infection, and this painting is hanging at the Tate Gallery. However, in this picture, you'll see that there is light coming in through the window, and the artist said that this is to represent hope. Now, interestingly, this painting was created in 1891, and around that time was a, a real uh, 
new era for immunology. It was when the cellular theory of immunity was really coming together. The scientific theory behind vaccination was coming together. So I like to think that perhaps this hope rep represents the hope brought by this new scientific discovery. Thank you very much.